Welcome to vanofaction.com. That's real back there. This is part one of building my countertop. I'm doing it in two parts because there are a number of skills and actually I had to build a couple of tools to do this. And these are skills and tools that you'll be able to use in other parts of your build. And I don't just want to do a video to have you tell me how wonderful my countertop looks. I want you to be able to watch this video and then make a really nice countertop for yourself. So watch part one here. Part two will, will be linked at the end. Let's get started. What an amazing afternoon here in the mountains. The temperatures come up. It's late March. Temperatures come up. There's no snow left. It's really nice. And I've got to get this van on the road because it won't be long and we're going to want to use it. And this spring, I have to finish the plumbing. I have to do the plumbing. Last year, because of COVID, we were constantly waiting for materials. It's just... Uh, Everything was running late, and the, in fact, our first trip, we didn't even have the hydro hooked up. We finally got the solar panels and the roof rack done, but there was no running water, no plumbing. And I'm so glad it worked out that way, because the plumbing in this van, the idea, the, the, design, the design of it has evolved three or four times since we first got the idea of living in the van. And initially, our plan was to live full time in the van for at least a year. We're going to follow the sun, we're going to leave Ontario, follow the sun down into the southern United States and, and spend one winter without snow. And when we closed our eyes and envisioned that, we saw ourselves in camps or possibly boondocking in the desert. But we were so for plumbing, we we're going to have a porta potty when we needed it, but we anticipated having facilities most of the time. And for a shower, I was going to put a, an outdoor shower at the back of the van, as many people do. And then if we were in a camp where you couldn't use the outdoor shower, well, the camp would have facilities so we could use those. So I was not going to have an indoor shower, probably mostly because I thought it would take way too, they take up way too much space. And I didn't want to have to do all the plumbing under the body of the van for like gray water tanks and all that stuff if we didn't need to. But then COVID came along. And at the first part of COVID, we thought, holy smokes, we can't go south of the border. The border's closed. We can't do that anyway. And we're not comfortable. I mean, for at the first part, you couldn't even stop along the road and use a toilet somewhere, you know? So, well, we better have better have facilities. So we, we were still the porta potty was what we we're gonna use for a toilet, but we better have a shower indoors, better have a kitchen sink, and better have you know facilities for doing all that inside the van because that may be the way life is from now on. But then last year when we were out on the road, we found that the camps were, even then, the camps were very clean. People were being very careful and we were comfortable using the showers in the camp. So then suddenly we're saying, well, now we don't need an indoor shower. So I built the cabinets to accommodate an indoor shower. I even had the hole cut in the floor to, for the gray water tank. I bought the gray water tank, but then I thought, well, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that. So now we're not going to do that. I'm so glad it worked out that way. That's number one. The second reason I'm so glad it, I didn't get the plumbing done is I don't have a kitchen countertop yet. Just a piece of plywood on the top because the sink is supposed to go right here in front of the door. And um, we found the way we ended up using the van because we spend, we do our cooking uh, outside the van at a, at a table, at a picnic table or whatever. Th this became a real staging area. We were constantly getting our, our, our boxes, our, like our, the, the, the crate of dishes and pots and food, and they would all sit up here. One person would put it here and the other person would meet it here and take it to the table kind of thing. So having a hole right here with a sink in it would probably be a bit of an issue. Having a faucet sticking up would be a bit of an issue. So I've had to rethink that design as well. It's worked out really well, but now it's time to get started. And I've got the sink ordered. It'll be coming in on Monday, and we're going to start with it. If there's one thing I've learned in my lifetime, is to keep things simple. So the plumbing in this van couldn't be any easier, really. It's, uh, it's all concentrated on the passenger side, and it's all within about five or six feet. Starting at the back, there'll be the exterior shower, and there'll be the fill ports just inside the back door, so it's secure. And then there'll be a hot water tank, there'll be a, a fresh water tank, and then there'll be a hot and cold line that'll run from that end under the kitchen counter into where the sink's going to go. The fresh water tank we're, we're going to have will be 10 gallons. And the hot water tank we were going to have was going to be a four gallon electric hot water tank. But unfortunately, I ordered the fresh water tank and then the, the, the hot water tank wasn't available because of COVID. Nothing's coming out of China. So I had to buy a, a different model. So I've got a six gallon hot water tank. We're going to have, because we do a lot of our cooking, all of them, we do all our cooking outside the van, we're going to have three or four ga single gallon bottles of water we take to the picnic table as if you were camping. That's how, that's how we choose to live. We like it that way. So the, the water that we use inside will be very minimal in this sink. We don't expect to ever be doing dishes here unless it's a rainy day or, or we just have a stop on the road for a lunch or something, have a snack, we have to rinse off a plate. 
but the uh, this this sink will be used very little and most of the fresh water we anticipate will be used for showering so it's a six gallon hot water tank with 10 gallons of cold water this gives us 16 gallons altogether, and that's lots that's lots for a shower if you want to have one so that's uh, that should work out just fine for well us. this is what i'm thinking if this was the tradition if this is the cabinet and there's a one by two on it for nosing a traditional self-edged is what it's called a square edged arborite cupboard or countertop that you would make would look like this. Would have a solid nosing coming down. The ar the piece would be built like this. Probably a like like that with a like a little piece screwed together for a nosing. And then the arborite itself would go on and come down. And truthfully, I I want it to look nicer than that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to have the traditional cabinet. And then I'm going to put a piece of plywood on. Oh, that looked nice. run on a little bit further. A solid piece of wood. The plywood will come out. And then I'm going to put a, a chamfer on that piece of wood. So, and the arborite itself will only come this far. That will give me a little exposed wood on the on the chamfer side, and an exposed wood here. Now, because the wood's exposed, it has to be a little bit more durable than cedar. So I picked, but I'd like it to match the cedar if I can. So I picked up some fir. We're first thing we're going to do is fit the countertop blank to the cabinet itself. I have to see how that's going to work out. And just like everything else in this build, we're running into some not things that are, don't come together square or things that aren't straight and it's just normal we're gonna have a little bit of scribing to do the first thing we have to do whenever you're scribing anything the first thing you have to do is line up at least one side so it's perfectly straight and parallel to where it's going to ultimately end up being in this case we're going to deal with the front of this cap of this countertop and i'm going to set it so that it's absolutely parallel to the front of the cabinet now i know that this line is exactly where it's going to be. This has to be pushed in a bit, and that's good. That's the first step. Once I've got that situated, I know I'm long here. Ultimately, I'm gonna be cutting something off of here. I know that I'm wide. I'll be wide at this end. I'll have something that I have to do there. But right at the moment, I'm touching here along the side, and I'm touching at the end. The first question I have to ask is, of the pieces I have to scribe, of the sides I have to scribe, are there any sides that there that have forgiveness in them and are there any sides that are going to be exposed so i know that ultimately this back is going to have a splash on it the countertop is going to come along and come up and be a bit of a splash like you'd see in a regular kitchen that side has some forgiveness it doesn't have to be a tight fit this side however is going to be a butt joint between the countertop and this wall so this needs to be fitted properly. The first, the, the part I need to focus on first is this end. This is interesting. The surface I'm trying to describe too isn't smooth. It's a real pebbly finish. And I'm certainly not gonna try and scribe to every pebble. That would just be crazy. But at the same time, I can't really run my scribing tool along that face because I won't get a smooth line. I get a bumpy line, which is not what I want. There's a couple ways to try and get around that. One would be to put some, well, the first thing I need to do is, is see if that line is straight that I'm trying to scribe to. So if I put a straight edge against it and look down, if I can get my countertop to be, to be that tight against that wall, I'd be perfectly happy with that. And I know that my square is straight. So now I could take a piece of smooth material that was light and put it up against the wall and take my scribing tool and inscribe along this way, that would give me a nice smooth line. There's no question about it, that would be fine. But that'd be kind of cumbersome and it's introducing a, a several moving parts that I don't wanna, I wanna introduce. So the simpler I can make it, the better. So what I've done is I have moved the countertop away from the surface, not quite the width of this square. So when I put this square against the wall, it completely covers you can see there's, not, there's just a little bit of the corner left over. So now, 
I can hold the square against the wall and just mark this side of it and that'll give me the line that I want. I have the countertop fitted at this end. This is the exposed end by the bed. And now I want to fit it to the outsides of the, of the van, follow that shape. So the first thing I've done is I've set the front of the countertop exactly parallel to the front of the cabinet. And now I just have to determine how much I want to take off this side so that this side moves over the right dimension. Now you see, because because of this backsplash, I can't be straight up and down. I'm tipping. I have to tip my scribing tool to get it in there. So what I'm going to do just to check is I want to make sure that I'm my full inch away and I'm not. I'm only three quarters of an inch away. So I'm going to mark my one inch here. And then I'm going to open my scribing tool so that I get the right dimension when I'm holding it at an angle. And now I'm going to have to very carefully try and hold the same angle as I scribe along this piece. Come and take a look at this. Now I have the back fitted where I want it. A little bit of room, that's good. This end, I double check it because it's moved a bit. I just to make sure it's all right, and it is. And the front edge is exactly where I want it. Once I get the nosing on this countertop, the front of the counter will just be a little bit proud of the cabinet doors, which is exactly what I want. I don't want it overhanging too far because that'll take space away from the galley, but just a little bit over so, so that these are underneath the lip, that'd be great. But, on the front of the cabinet, on this face, I don't need the overhang. I can finish it off so that the nosing comes in almost flush with the cabinet. And I can do the same on this side. So now that I have it fixed or fitted on the left side as we're looking at it, the right side as we're looking at it, and the far end, this is exactly where the countertop's gonna sit. So now I just have to trim off these two sides and I can mark both of them at the same time. Normally when you're scribing, you just do one side at a time because you can't chase it around. One side at a time, and then you reach a point where you say, okay, now I've got it exactly where I want it. This end needs to come off. This end needs to come off. I can mark it very easily. The counter is fitted, ready for the edging and the splash, which I can do, oh, I, can, I just have to get those things done before I install it. I wanna make sure, I wanna make it my, my hole in for the sink because, and the, uh, the tap set. Now, as I was saying, this is the part of the counter where the sink was supposed to go. But this is the part of the counter where we're constantly staging things, setting things as they go outside. So I don't want to have a hole right here. So I decided to put my sink in under the counter, an undermount sink, and then I'll make a, a cover for it that matches the countertop with, a, with a, a way to get it open. And that way, probably... 99.9% .9 of the time that cover will just be there but if we ever need the sink we can lift it up and the sink will be below. I'm going to do that and I'm going to use this sink because this is the shallowest sink I could find. It's only five and a half inches and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Dave that's a top mounted sink and it is. This is a sink that was made to go in from the top but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put it up from the bottom. I'm going to show you how. I'm not concerned about it at all. The other thing though is, once I get my sink here, let's see here, let's see. Once I have the sink hole here, I don't wanna have a faucet right here blocking everything. So I bought a faucet that has a long gooseneck and I'm gonna mount it beside the rail of the, the, the truck and then it'll swing over when I need it to have, when I want water in the sink, I can, we can swing it over. Otherwise we can roll it back against the wall so that it's, it's out of the way. That's, that's the target. So right now it's, it's a question of putting this sink in the right place. And here it is with the hole cut. But I've got a problem. Let me show you. 
Now, this is what I did. There's the countertop with a hole cut in it. And here is the sink with the sink template on top of it. And that template is to mark out a hole that's the right size for the sink to drop into to be a surface mounted sink. But I want it to be an undermounted sink. And so I looked at it and I thought, this is not enough of a lip. I want to make a panel that'll sit on top of the sink so that when we're not using it as a sink, which is all just countertop. And I thought, that's not enough of a lip. I have to make it bigger. But I wasn't careful. And this is what I did. This is what I ended up with after my first cut. And from this distance, it looks pretty good. It looks really good. But if you get up closer, you'll see it's not quite, see a little jiggle there? Come around the corners, it doesn't, it doesn't come out just properly. That's gonna be hard to edge and it's gonna be hard to make a template for it. So I'm gonna have to, uh, see it just comes, it doesn't come out quite just right to the corners. So I had a little cleaning up to do. I want to show you. I want to show you how I'm doing this. Uh, how I because it's something that you might find handy. The the sides of the sink taper as they go down, so I want to catch my my scribe right near the top of the sink. And so the, what I've done is I've, I want to come down an inch. So I, I, I'm going to make a little jig to, for the scribe. I take this like a scrap piece of plywood. And I ran it in on the saw blade until I and until I, I went as far as I wanted to go. And then I marked where the edge of that, as far as in as I pushed it. Then I turned the board over, turn the board over and I move the fence until it lines up with the saw cut again. So if you notice I'm not measuring anything here and cover your ears. I'm gonna push it in until it gets to that tape again. Now you can't, you can't see it in here, but because I ran it over the saw and then turned it over and ran it over the saw, what I have inside is actually two saw cuts like this. So I've got a point in there. And what I wanted to do now is cut this end of it off on that, those two lines, which will give me a point. I could do that with a handsaw. I could do it with a, a, with a hacksaw. I could do it with a jigsaw, but I was doing some work for a friend and I borrowed my daughter's a, a chop saw, so I'm gonna use that. Okay, we're gonna try this again. I have drilled out the hole again, and I've got a new pencil. This one's silver. Maybe it's my lucky pencil. And I got, oh, wow. I got these pencils at the dollar store. They've got this kind of gold or this uh, flaky stuff on it. So it's good for this exact thing is that I can tap it in keep an eye on it this time there we are sticking out now we'll let's see what we can this. do the important thing is to make sure that you've got your sink on the countertop where you want it to be and a smart person would clamp this down somehow and fix it so it can't move but i'm not doing that right now what i'm going to try to do first is just Ooh, let's wait okay So now the goal is to dress off to the line all the way around so it's, it's parallel to the side of the sink. That's going to be a challenging thing to do. There's a, a number of different tools you could use, but what I'm going to use is my hand drill with this sanding drum on as an attachment. But it's really critical that, the, that this edge be perpendicular to the top. It's got to come across and go straight down. And that's going to be a difficult thing to do freehand. So what do you do when you want to try and hold something the same way for a whole lot of work? Say it together now. We're going to make a jig for the drill. Here we are 10 minutes later. And this is the jig I've made to hold my drill as I sand off around the sink. It's one major piece of wood that I have this, the drill clamped to. It's a flat piece that's perpendicular to this one, that's gonna ride on the tabletop, the countertop. This is just a brace piece to make sure that it stays 90 degrees. And then I put a piece of the end here to be able to position the, the drill handle in a right to left direction. It's really critical that this be 90 degrees. Now, I don't know if I can show, hopefully I can show you this. Let's see if I can show you this. It's important that that be square. Now that looks pretty darn close. That was very good indeed. 
little, little bit. Hopefully you can see it's a little bit open at the top. I want to push the sanding head that way a little bit. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to put a wedge at this end of the drill. I made some little wedges up. Before I cinch it down tight, I can just put a wedge in there and push it in a little bit. Oh, that looks just about perfect now. Hopefully you can see that. Excellent. Now, I also want to have it straight up and down or perpendicular in this direction too. And you can see it's leaning. It wants to go that way. So again, the reason for this piece is I can take and I can put a wedge in there and just keep pushing that wedge up in until it looks like it is where you want it to be. My head is 90 degrees. Perfect, good. Now I should just be able to cinch that down with my And check it all to make sure. And there we are. Nice and even all the way around. And I've got a nice slip that my board's going to be able, my cutting board cover sink cover is going to be able to sit on. That's just ideal. And there's still enough flange underneath that I can get my screws into. And that's great. Now these drill attachments for your sanding drums for your drill, you can buy those at any lumber yard. Probably get a set of two or three different sizes for somewhere between $12 and $20. They'll come with a whole bunch of these, uh, these covers for them already. I've had this one for probably 10 years. You don't use them very often, but when you have a need of it, there really isn't anything else that, that'll do the job for you and make it half as easy as this is. It's just amazing. Got a nice smooth corners. This is gonna be ideal. And you saw it, it didn't take 10 minutes. Now that's the end of part one. Hope you're finding this useful. If you are, by all means, give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. But, Watch part two. I'll link to it here as soon as it's ready. And these other links on this end screen will be useful to your build. Thanks so much for stopping in and be sure to come back.